So, so the next <laughs> session is going to be on applications in the cloud. And, and we are incredibly excited to have a long time sort of believer in the high, one of the industry's kind of foremost um, uh, thinkers and thought leaders, Paul Moritz, along with uh, Quentin Hardy, former New York Times, now editorial director of Google Cloud. Please join me in welcoming Quentin Hardy and Paul Moritz. <laughs> Um, well, I know many of you came here looking for business ideas, so I asked Paul to start with one, and I have one too, and we'll, then we'll work back. So, what's a good business idea for the room? Well, the, the, one, one of the uh, great things about going not first to these conferences, you can have an opinion on what everybody else before said. Uh, so, I want to reinforce uh, not so much a business idea but a caution uh, that I think came out at least through previous talks. Uh, and it reminds me of uh, uh, about four or five years ago when this whole machine learning thing was just starting to get going and I went out to visit, I think it was Unical out in the East Bay and they're sitting there with a bunch of grizzled old geophysicists uh, and I was gushing forth about all the miracles you could do with modern statistical uh, neural net based machine learning, and eventually the guy said, Stop. Or the grizzled computers said, Stop. He said, You know what? Every time I hear one of you guys say machine learning, I say, Go fetch the chicken. Because I know voodoo's coming next. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's really important to remember that machine learning is inherently naive. Uh, it can provide correlation, but not causation. Uh, and I, I, I think the what I'm starting to see now, and this is kind of the business idea, if you like, is it's really important to, when you're looking at injecting machine learning into a business idea, to combine it with real knowledge of causality. Uh, in other words, the, it's not enough, for instance, in the IoT world, just to have machine learning to try and find anomalous pat patterns in the signal. That doesn't tell you causation. You need to combine that with an actual physics-based digital model that gives you some idea of how to make inferences from the patterns that you're seeing. And I think it's those companies that combine uh, the ability of, of machine learning to very rapidly detect uh, patterns in data, but then combine that with the ability to make inferences, which has to be based on actual theories there's, there's a big data science conference in New Orleans this week, and they had something like 400 different whiteboard talks uh, around the room, and most of them, it seems like, have something to do with explainability, yes. you know, which is just a huge area inside this. Tell me why this makes sense. Take the, you know, point to the bias, you know, figure out, because AI and machine learning, the pattern finding at scale, you know, you can demystify it pretty quickly, right? Um, so I'll, I'll do my business idea. Good, and uh, then we can work back into why. Are you going to ask for funding afterwards? Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I'll do two business ideas. One, Michael Chewing talked about like how these, you know, part of the business can be done by ML, but not all of it, right? And people will still be in the picture. Well, Michael Chewy then had to leave because he had a flight to London. Someone wants to meet Michael Chewy later this week. He has to be there in person. And all of you are affluent, intelligent, busy people who came here to be in this room. Human moments are super valuable. What AI hasn't done yet is help allocate human moments particularly well. Like, in a business, to find to get AI that says, this is the highest value thing you could be doing with another person. Much like that engineer, the first speaker talked about, you know, who has to call a customer. Call a customer this week, here's the most high value customer you can talk to. Something like that would be a nice little service. But, my own. You want to do that for conferences as well? Absolutely. Here's the most, 10 most valuable people you might want to meet. Um, and, and what to ask them about, you know, what's on their minds. But um, in terms of cloud applications in the cloud, which is the subject of our talk today, I think what's very interesting right now is the way in which, I'm going to argue cloud is a platform, you can argue whether or not it is, but all new tech platforms in some sense evoke or create new types of data from new directions. And 
that calls for new types of databases and new data activities. So some kind of dashboard against which applications can have new databases suggested or easily interoperated, I think will be a feature inside cloud. Yeah, and this gets into the discussion that, uh, that you touched on there, which is in what way is cloud a platform or not a platform? Uh, and the reason I didn't think about this is typically in history, when we've had a new platform, there have been certain companies in the applications or services space, services space that have emerged as the winners on that, uh, on that particular platform. They typically need new companies that then disrupt the old companies. Uh, you know, to, to your point about databases and change, for instance, I remember uh, Hasso Plattner of SAP uh, telling me that when he made the decision to rewrite what was then R2, which was one of the several mainframe-based packages, and come up with R3, uh, he made the then avant-garde decision to base it on a relational database. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is probably 1987, 88 there, and he says it nearly killed the company because in 1987 or 88, uh, the relational database was too computationally intensive to run on a mainframe. And Oracle had been for And, and they nearly, well, it was, they nearly went bankrupt because of that, but Oracle, which was based on Unix mini computers, which are powered by microprocessors that are making CPU cycles dramatically cheaper, saved the company. And that gets into this issue of, is the cloud a new platform, and, and is it a new platform from an architectural perspective, or is it a new platform from a delivery perspective, or both? If you look at it from an architectural perspective, the only thing that's fundamentally different, I think, about the cloud is the potential for much greater parallelism. Uh, what is different from a developer's perspective about the cloud is, is that you now can conceivably go to your engine in the cloud and say, I want a thousand memory and CPU instances and I want them for the next 30 minutes and I'm going to give it back to you. And I'm going to apply that to my problem. Uh, and that really has, that degree of parallelism, and one other case I'm going to get to, hasn't really been exploited yet except perhaps in the Hadoop infrastructure. Uh, you know, Google likewise had to make a very uh, important decision and they tried to index all the world's information because back in the late 1990s already the world's, the index for the, for the whole internet was going to be many gigabytes big. And if you had gone to Oracle in 1999 and said, give me 20 gigabytes uh, of data storage, uh, Oracle would be happy to sell it to you and they'd be giving you a $10 billion check or, 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 or bill for doing that. So they had to go this route of massive parallelization of very cheap machines. And that, you know, gave birth to Hadoop, et cetera, and now Spark, et cetera. The other place where uh, parallelization is happening is actually sort of micro parallelization in the GPUs. Uh, so now you're starting to see for the first time, not so much the learning cycle, but the interest cycle of AI starting to be implemented on these GPUs. Uh, and you can say that that is that is a new capability now that developers can reach for. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think we've really seen that play out in the, with the exception of Hadoop and Spark, maybe as, as you're saying, this is the canonical service that is only available on the cloud, viewed as an architecture, versus uh, other approaches. Most other approaches have really been about the cloud as a, as a place and a delivery mechanism. Uh, and those really haven't given rise to new applications, they really given mostly rise to new business models. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's nothing inherently technically complex, with one exception, uh, in what Uber did. Uh, the one service that I think actually Uber probably needed to get s started, which they could only have got from the cloud at that time, is actually Google Maps, uh, which I think, if you think about it, at least for me, which was what made the initial use of Uber an epic experience because instead of taking the driver's word for it, you could actually look at a goddamn map and see whether it really was coming to you or, or not. And it, it would have been prohibitive for a startup company to try and assemble a complete map uh, of their own. So being able to get that as a service out of the cloud probably was a critical enabling function. So 
one of the things I've been trying to think through are what are the other such services uh, that would enable a new generation of applications if we have them freely available in the cloud? Mm. Well, I think the other thing about Uber, Uber is an interesting case, and we're starting to see a similar phenomenon in traditional businesses. <coughs> what Uber did, in a sense, was virtualize cars into taxi fleets by using mobility, social network design, um, mobile payments, all through the cloud. You couldn't have, you couldn't have capitalized the prototype. You had to have a cheap cloud to do that, for sure. And in a sense, that kind of prototyping and modeling as a digital event or a taxi fleet is now taking place in some companies. We had a company on stage uh, at our event next last month. This company is Sandvik. I, I don't know if you've heard of them. They're a Swedish company. They do mining and they have machines that turn ingots into machine parts. And this is an area where that machine on the factory floor is essentially from about 1965. It's got 200 buttons. It takes two years to learn how to use it. It's very cumbersome. It's also how pretty much every car door and airplane wing in the country gets made, in the world gets made. It's utterly critical stuff. And you know, it had just sort of gone along in the same process for ages. Well, they, we containerized it, and now it exists as an app on a tablet that you can start to work with in 15 minutes, right? And that enabled them to then sort of abstract their whole business and see it as a series of potential recipes you can download from the cloud to this machine and it be, you know, with a tablet working the intermediation. So that capability of the cloud of abstracting a lot of complexity into a single unit that you can then manipulate. No, I, I, I think you know, the, this, the cloud as a repository is a place where a developer can go and get easy access to a set of broader services and higher level services than they would have been able to do before. That you can go there, you can get payments, uh, maps, you can get all of these things essentially on tap for your application. Uh, significantly lowers the barrier for entry for new people who want to go in and either redo business models or generate new business models. So I, I think part of this quest for the new winners of the cloud, as I said, is not so much to look in the traditional application sense, although I think there is one that is yet to be done, which I'll come back to, but is to look for these business models that can now be redone or, 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 or done de novo out of, out of the cloud. The application that I think we still haven't seen yet uh, in, in the traditional application sense is, is something that will do for small, do for big data what Excel did for small data. Uh, when you think about it, there's only been one tool, that large, one programming tool that a large millions of people, tens of millions of people have been able to wrap their minds around, that is the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. uh, every other form of programming, visual programming, etc., hasn't worked. Uh, the people have been able to wrap their mind around the spreadsheet, and but it, it has limitations uh, in the sense that the spreadsheet model only works for data up to a size, not just for physical machine reasons, but because the grid model isn't appropriate for handling large amounts of data. And we. And I learned this from the uh, defense and intelligence communities. They say, look, we've got a new generation of people that we call data citizens. Uh, these are people who are going to have to work with large data sets, but they're never going to be data scientists. These people are never going to write R code. Uh, but they do need to bring data sets together, make inferences from those data mm -hmm. uh, sets, they need to visualize that data, et cetera. And we, today, to try and do that, they have to assemble five or six different tools to do that. They have to use tri-factor for the data ingest problem, because when you're dealing with big data, the data is invariably incomplete, has errors in it, et cetera, that have to be cleaned up. Uh, you, you know, you then may use click view to slice and dice it, and then you might try and pipe it into Excel, because Excel is still the data visualization tool of choice, et cetera. So they have a complex workflow of tools that they have to try and assemble. That needs to get collapsed. That needs to be put into a single paradigm. And there's some hard conceptual problems to be solved here. Uh, and that tool needs to work with terabytes of data, tens of terabytes of data, ultimately petabytes of data, which means 
it cannot be done on a laptop. That, that application will have to be cloud hosted. It will have to do under the hood what Hadoop does in terms of scatter gather uh, processing. Of data, uh, it's going to be kind of hard to know in a way. Um, yesterday at I.O., Google talked about um, voice recognition that had been in the cloud. And it was a TensorFlow problem that required 100 gigabits. And they found a way to do it nested in a phone for a half a gigabit. Yeah, so you can always get great AI jobs. And yeah, I mean, you can always get very, very smart through better algorithms. Yeah. When you're dealing with raw data, when the raw data says a 10 uh, is a petabyte in size, right. you can't compress it. There's, there's, there's no compression <coughs> algorithm rule that's going to get that down to fit into a tablet. That said, that doesn't sound like an insoluble problem. It's not an insoluble problem. There are actually some hard conceptual problems in the sense that how end users work with tabular data, people have, have tried that problem. We've had pivot tables in Excel that haven't really been generally success, be successful. So, Nobody's quite found a way to provide the, the metaphor for working with big data that quote unquote data citizens can wrap their minds around. Right, and this is before 5G shows up and really loads up what data is. Exactly. And the relationships among data points start to become as important as the data itself. Well, you know, it, 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 as people start to work with these data sets, it, over time it needs to become easy for data citizens to apply not just slicing and dicing and visualization of data, that they're going to want to put machine learning against it so they can extract hidden features out of the data. So that, that I think, is, is uh, still an opportunity out there, which is for somebody to come up with a tool that, like I said, does the big data what Excel did for small data. Mm -hmm. Another thing that um, I haven't seen talked about much of these is uh, the very the very quick advent of AR, augmented reality, inside the world. Because we talk about digitizing businesses and putting physical things in the cloud. Things are going in the other direction, too. And so that models can be projected onto the physical world in new ways. And build Microsoft did a, a version of Minecraft as a game. And games are interesting because that's where you test things out. But then it comes into other businesses as costs drop and capabilities increase. Yeah, I, I, I said this cloud is, is uh, not interesting if you just view it as a data center in isolation. Uh, if, yeah. you, if you view it as an intelligent repository that's interacting with intelligent endpoints, uh, then that that is really the, the complete definition of the platform, if you like. Uh, and you're right in the sense that the intelligent endpoints are going to be able to present data in new and interesting ways mm -hmm. uh, to the user. So I think, you know, that is an interesting time. Uh, so I think it, it's possible that even though I say up until now, the cloud's biggest impact really has been to enable new business models, that pendulum may swing and we may yet see some really interesting new general applications come out of it as well. This is like that edge core dynamic that made Cisco rich, isn't it? Like, the more powerful edge challenges the core. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> Build a bigger core, you can do more in the well, edge. edge. You and I were saying, you know, if you stay long enough in this industry, you'll see it come around again. Yeah, uh, except quantitative uh, changes are qualitative changes. Yeah, when well, you can compute that without, much without, any, without any pressure. You're in a new space. But maybe we have to go a minute to 30 Let's seconds. Just, Is there one question, two questions? How are we doing for just an opinion, I'd love to hear. So Take a question uh, for a break. Got anything? Any questions? Any, anybody have an idea of a great app for the cloud? Yeah, come on. You got a room full of VCs here. <laughs> Checkbooks ready. What would you like to call the fun? <laughs> okay, that's my question. You touched upon the 5G, right? How the 5G is going to bring you know, some application closer to. Uh, all the users and some of the high you know, uh, gigabit or pentabytes and you know, so on, right? Uh, is the service provider you know, up to it? Are they looking at you know, the cloud native uh, you know, virtualization of their network services and integration with IoT and all of that? Do you see that happening? Uh, you know, you shouldn't ask me about service providers. Uh, you know, the, the, but I retired now, so what the hell? You know, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the answer is no, they're not. Uh, 
uh, they talk a good line, but at the end of the day, they're dumb pipes. Uh, and so, you know, they, other people will take advantage of the capabilities they provide, and, 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 and that's actually the way it should be, uh, in my opinion. Uh, uh, uh. Now, they, they are going to, there is going to be the need for uh, the ability, as they manage their networks now, to have much more sophisticated, capable diagnostic tools simply because the amount of traffic going across is going to be that much greater. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay.